we're in a series called Jesus is Rewriting Our Story. And Jesus um, found himself one day in the nation of Samaria. Samaria was the place that the Jewish people, if they had to get to a location on the other side of Samaria, they would go miles in the wrong direction to go around Samaria. They hated the Samaritan people. And Jesus was like, hey, we need to get through Samaria, but we're not going to go around it. We're going to go right in the middle of it. And then he sends his disciples to go and get meals for them in the town. And while they're getting a meal in town, he meets a woman. The woman came at noontime, in the middle of the heat of the day, because their culture was to get water every day you would go to the, the local well. Well, everyone would go in the cool of the day. So for her to go in the middle of the day meant she was trying to avoid all of the people that came in the cool of the day. Her story was a disaster. It was a a complete mess. And Jesus has this incredible ability to insert himself where the culture had built up walls. There were religious walls between the Jews and the Samaritans. There were racial walls between the Jews and the Samaritans. And in this situation, there were gender walls. Jewish people didn't talk to Samaritans. They, They were the dirty people. They were the ones that had slept with the Romans and slept with the Greeks, and they didn't keep the the Jewish bloodline clean, and they blamed the Samaritans for the fall of their nation. And men in that day and age thought that they were better than women. So men wouldn't even talk to women on the street because they were so much more superior. So Jesus inserts himself in the story, shatters the social norms, breaks down the walls, and begins to build a bridge. And he looks at this woman and says, would you give me some water? She is absolutely shocked. She's like, you do realize that I'm a woman. He's like, actually, if you knew who you were talking to, you would ask me for a cup of water. Because the water that I have is is living water. It's the kind of water that you would never thirst again. She's like, if I never had to come back to this well again, that would be awesome. Jesus tells her, hey, why don't you go get your husband, bring him back here, and we'll talk about this living water. She says, I have no husband. And now you have to understand the culture and the context for what came next. Because what happened before brought down her defenses. Jesus was aware of her emotional condition to know how to engage with this woman. And he says, you're right. You don't have a husband. You've had five husbands. And the man you're with right now, you're not married to. And she's like, I perceive that you're a prophet. (laughs) How could you possibly have known that? And she's very aware that there is greatness in front of her. And trying to relate with his greatness, she says, "Uh, actually, we are praying, too, for the the coming Messiah, like the one that is going to redeem Israel, the one that's going to make this all right. And a Samaritan woman talking to a Jewish male rabbi, he hasn't even revealed to his disciples who he is. But to this woman, because of the value that he saw in her, he says, hey, that Messiah, that's me. She had one encounter with Jesus, and it changed everything. The value that was present in Jesus, the value that Jesus wanted to have inside of his church, the value that he wants in Vibrant is this. People are our heart. You see, the disciples had this propensity to try to make it about them. They wanted to turn the teachings of Jesus, the message of Jesus, the gathering around Jesus uh, about them. And I think that temptation easily can live inside of the church. Have you ever met someone that wanted to make it all about them? Right? I've seen some nods. I'm like, yeah, that's probably true. Uh, The temptation that lives in church is to make us think that this is about us. But the message of Jesus is when you begin to follow Jesus, you are now on the rescue mission of Jesus. So I have four kids. Uh, my wife, John, and I actually this next week are going to celebrate our 16th anniversary. Come on, somebody. So we, we have four kids, and, and Levi is our oldest. And when he was four, and Eden, our oldest daughter, was two, Eden was one of those kids that just magically disappeared. Have you ever met one of those kids? Like, you play hide-and-go-seek, and they take it to a whole new level. She, she was the two-year-old that figured out how to get out of the house, 
She was the two-year-old that figured out how to get lost. She was the two-year-old that didn't necessarily want to be found. Like, I've got two littles right now, and we were playing hide-and-go-seek last night. And my youngest son, Benaya, I'd say, Benaya, I'm coming to get you. Are you in the bathroom? He's like, no, I'm in your shower. Like, he'll tell us where he's at. Eden was not that way. Eden disappeared. And when you've got little kids at home and you recognize that it's quiet, you know something's wrong. And I realized it is way too quiet. And I looked over and I see Levi. I'm like, where's Eden? Where did Eden go? Eden, where are you? No reply. Nothing at all. I'm like, oh no, something's wrong. And I go get my wife, John. I'm like, John, did you know where Eden's at? She's like, I have no idea where Eden's at. And we start frantically looking through the house. We're looking under the bed. We're, I mean, as a parent, you're like, did they choke on something? Did they go run into the street? Did they meet a bad dog? Like, where is Eden? And we're panicking. Like, we've been looking for minutes now. We can't find her. She's not responding. And here comes Levi. Dad, I want a snack. <laughs> hey, Levi, we're, we're trying to find your sister right now. Um, We'll talk about your snack later. And he starts to cry. <laughs> but dad, I want a snack right now. I'm really hungry. Levi, let's find your sister, join the me- rescue mission of Eden, and then we'll talk about your hunger. And you know what I found? I meet a lot of church people like the four-year-old son. Feed me. Make it about me. It's really dark. They made me sit up front this week. (laughs) The end of Jesus' life, he gave what was called the Great Commission. And I wonder how many of us have turned the Great Commission into the Great Suggestion. See, there were four Gospels, four accounts of the life of Jesus from his followers. And I want to share with you those accounts. So the first one was a guy named Matthew. Matthew was brilliant. Matthew was a tax collector that knew how to keep great records. And here's what Matthew said. He said, therefore, go and make disciples. This is Jesus telling them. Go and make disciples of of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey. Man, I think the church could get a little bit more into this. This isn't legalism. I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. But teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded with, commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The second gospel was Mark. So Mark was a different kind of a personality. Uh, he, he was a writer for most likely Peter. Peter was that relational guy. He didn't know how to keep records of anything. He just loved people. And here's what Mark wrote through Peter most likely. He said to them, go into all the world preaching the good news. What's the good news? You don't have to stay where you are. You don't have to stay stuck where you are. Hey, you can quit religion and know God. Luke was a doctor. Here's what Luke said. Luke said, with my authority, take this message. So he's giving the message of Jesus, what Jesus said through Mark. With all my authority, take this message of repentance, which, by the way, the the good news, the gospel, without repentance isn't the gospel. If there's no, hey, God, my life is yours, my ways are yours, not that we're walking in perfection. I'm going to get into this a little bit later, into the message, but it requires a repentance. There is something, God, you need to forgive me for. The message of repentance to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem, which, by the way, all the Jewish people are freaking out. It's like, no, this is for the Jews. He's like, no, this is for everybody. There is forgiveness for all sins for all who turn to me. And then there was John. John was most likely a middle school age boy when he was following Jesus. And John was this relational guy. Like, he referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved the most. So this is John. John says it like this, is, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. After the Gospels was the story of Acts, which was the beginning of the church. And Jesus' message, the last thing that he said, as the church was about to begin before the Spirit of God would fall, he said it like this. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This was a really big deal. These disciples, 
began to start churches, plant churches, and they, they sent people out. They didn't just gather people in. It was, hey, we're going to come together, so we get to go out. And they walked in this incredible reality that was consistent throughout the message of Jesus. Heaven is real. Hell is real. Hell is not the place that God sends people he's mad at. Hell is the place for, for people who choose to pay their own bill. Because the good news is Jesus paid a bill, and any, the bill of sin, and anyone who responds to that can be forgiven. They just get to receive it. That's the message of Jesus. And because heaven is real and hell is real, eternity is really long. So we said, hey, my purpose in you, what I want you as disciples to do is be all about people. In fact, I want, if I could package it to you in a phrase, it'd be this. Found people, find people. Yeah. Found people, find people. Now, here's what you don't find. Uh, you don't find it in Scripture that people found God. God was never missing. God was never lost. Okay. Uh, another common one that I've heard recently is I'm trying to find myself. You know what I've never heard? I've never met someone that was like, you know what? I was in Walmart the other day buying some Cheetos and, and some soda. And while I was in Walmart, I looked down the aisle and I found myself. There I was. And I went and I hugged myself and we embraced. It's never happened. <laughs> Here's how the message of Jesus gets spread. Found people, find people. The problem with that is often our vision. Because we can't find what we cannot see. See, the enemy, you have a real enemy. If you didn't know that, welcome to reality. You have an enemy that wants to keep you out of this mission. He wants to keep you out of the game of God inside of his church, which is rescuing not bad people to become good people, lost people to become found people. He wants you to be consumed with you and your problems, that your life would be circled around you. Jesus is like, no, 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 there's, there's a secret if you were consumed with other people, God would be fulfilling your needs. But first, he wants you to be filled and consumed with reaching people who don't know Jesus yet. You see, the disciples only saw Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman, and they didn't get it. In fact, this is where the story begins for us. Just then, his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. They're like, what just happened? And then this next phrase, but no one asked. I don't know if you've ever told a story before, but you often leave out the parts that didn't happen. He's like, but there was something that didn't happen that should have happened. But, but no one asked Jesus, what do you want? What do you want us to do right now? You see, Jesus had purpose in, in every step. Jesus lived his life on mission. He, he fulfilled his purpose in about a three and a half-ish year window from the time that he was baptized to the crucifixion and resurrection and the beginning of the new church. No, no one asked, what do you want? It's like, uh, uh, you know the question I wish I would have asked? Why are you talking to her? The woman, then leaving her wa water jar, the woman went back to the town the very people that she was once avoiding after she met Jesus, and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. They're like, we already know what you've done. <laughs> he did it, and he told me all about it. It's a small town. Could, could this be Christ? They've not watched her get her act together. They've not watched her do anything right yet. But here's how the town responded. They came out of the town and made their way toward him. See that? Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. What are they consumed with? They're filled with, like, Jesus, we haven't eaten in a while. You, you need to have some, like, some lunch here. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. He's referring to the town. He's referring to, like, hey, I came to meet this woman so something can happen in this city. Then his disciples said to each other, could someone have, like, brought him Uber Eats or something? Like, <laughs> did we miss something? My food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and finish his work. Do you not say, do you not say four months more and then the harvest comes? So the disciples are thinking about their stomachs. They're thinking about 
their needs. They're consumed with something other than the mission of Jesus. And Jesus is saying, hey, do you, do you not see what's happening here? In fact, this last phrase, the four months more and then the harvest, was a, a common phrase of procrastination. Hey, four months later and the harvest are come. There's not a lot we can do right now. It's just going to happen. We've planted the seed. How, how this happens in the church today is once I get my life in order, I'll jump back in on this mission. Hey, one, once I get some things in my life cleaned up a little bit, Hey, once, once I stop being so busy, hey, once my business gets to this level, once my kids get to this age, and fill in the blank. Here's what I know. Once you get whatever it is to the other corner that you think once I get there, I'll finally arrive, you just realize there's another corner. And he's like, no, 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 no. Stop saying four months more and then the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They're ripe. Open your eyes. Jesus was saying, hey, you don't see yet what I see. And my prayer, as I've been praying all week long for you on our birthday, celebration, anniversary, is that God would open your eyes to see something. That, that if you would stop just seeing your needs and you would see people, you would find that God, as you're caring for people, takes care of your needs. So my wife, Jonna, uh, has been nearsighted, and uh, this last year she got corrective surgery, which, by the way, uh, I've never had an issue with vision. It's been so confusing to me. So if you're nearsighted, that means that you can see what's near, but you can't see what's far. It's like going to the doctor with, like, a broken arm, and he's like, well, your foot works. <laughs> Thank you. You're nearsighted. And Jonna got corrective surgery that made it so she couldn't just see what, what was in front of her. She could actually see what was in the distance. And I've been praying, and what God spoke to me was that's the condition of many believers. We see what's only right in front of us. And I wonder if today the corrective surgery could be deep inside of your heart, inside of your soul. That your eyes would be open to something more. In fact, here's a way that I can help you know if you're nearsighted. If God answered all my prayers, would it change the world or just change me? If God answered every prayer that you prayed this week, would people outside of you and your immediate family experience the goodness of God? Studies show that in our planet, there are 5.4 billion people that don't know God. Local studies show that there are 2 million people right here in Broward that are far from God. Some of you, that number, you don't see it. You don't feel it. So I'm going to give you a picture. If I were to line a person up here, and then right behind him, another person. And I would just create a line, just back to back, real close. Not COVID conscious, just real close. <laughs> the, the line of two million people would extend from Miami to Jacksonville. 5.4 billion people. If you were to take the coast of California and line people all the way up to the coast of Georgia, build a bridge over the Atlantic Ocean into Europe, line them up all the way to the shores of China, build a bridge from China to California, the line would circle the globe five times, 10 times, 50 times, 124 times. Some of you don't see it yet. A couple years ago, I was sitting at my dining room table, and we had a young man uh, across the table from me, and we were just sharing stories of what I like to call a divine appointment, like a God assignment, like this is the thing that will set your faith afire when you start inviting God to give you a divine assignment, a divine appointment. I shared with him about how just the other day I was driving in my truck, and I had a water bottle and a bag of chips, and I came across a homeless guy like all of us do every, every day. And uh, God spoke to me and said, I want you to give your water bottle and your bag of chips to him. I'm like, okay. The light, light might go green beforehand. I'm not sure if he's going to make it. Well, anyways, he makes it to my truck. I give him the water bottle and I give him the bag of chips. And as I'm giving it to him, I hear God say, I want you to tell him something. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and God said, I, I want you to tell him that I'm not done with him. And as he grabs the water bottle, I squeeze tight and he kind of looks at me kind of like, what? And I said, hey, I, I was praying for you on your way over here. And I want to let you know that God's not done with you. He starts to cry. 
And as I'm telling the story at my dining room table, the guy that I'm telling begins to cry. Divine appointments. I've been doing this for a long time, but every day I ask God, God, would you give me three, three divine appointments today? Just three. And you know what I find? By the end of the day when I pray that prayer, I usually have more than three. Were they not there the days that I didn't pray it? I don't think that's true at all. I think my eyes just got open to see the thing that God had always had right in front of me. John Maxwell, my favorite author, he says, find their spiritual spot. What does that mean? Listen and ask a lot of questions. Don't argue with them. Don't try to convince them. And after you've listened and after you've asked questions, tell them your story. Hey, before I met Jesus, my life looked like this. And I met Jesus here, and here's how my life has changed since then. See, the good news, the message of hope, the message of Jesus is just that. I once was this, but now I'm that. And that can be true for you, and it's not because I did anything right. It's just because I invited God into my life, and this is what God did in me. You see, Jesus saw the world different than anything that the religious systems could do. Jesus didn't come to create a new religion. He came to end religion. You see, Jesus saw a world where people skeptical of what we believe are envious of how well we treat each other and are amazed at how well we treat them. The Romans hated the Jews. The Jews hated the Romans. They hated the Samaritans. They hated tax collectors. Not much unlike the world that we live in today. We live in an offended world where the left hates the right and the right hates the left. Racial divide says you've got to pick a side. Political divide, you've got to pick a side. Now it's masks and vaccinations. you got to pick a side. Jesus said, but, but among my people, it, it should be different. The people that are skeptical of what we believe are envious of how well we treat them. See, Jesus often met people that didn't believe like he believed. They didn't value what he believed. They didn't walk in morality or think about morality in the way that he did. But people that didn't believe like him, think like him, value like him, or live life like him, they loved him. They loved being around him. What could God do in our city if this was true about you? That even though they might believe different than you, value different than you, see morality different than you, what if they were amazed by the way that you treat them? them and want to be part of the community. In fact, we have people on our dream team that are not yet Jesus followers, and the reason why they love and they show up even at 6.30 to start setting up all of this, they're experiencing that. Jesus, when, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a, a shepherd. So the church of Jesus is not a museum of saints or for the saints. The church in Jesus' design was a hospital for the broken. You see, the city saw the woman by her choices. The disciples saw the woman by her race and by her gender. Jesus saw her based on who he originally created her to be and who she could become. And the world system could never produce what was happening right in front of him. It was the kingdom of God. You see, Jesus saw a world where people want the message of Jesus to be true before they believe. This last couple of weeks, I was talking with um, a Jewish guy in our community. He had done some work for me, and he came to my house to, to pick up a check, and it was a pretty good-sized check. And, and as I gave him the check, I did that thing again where I like held on to it for a second, and he looked up at me, and I said, hey, I just want to let you know that I've been praying for you this week, and God told me that you're overwhelmed and that you're completely at your end. And he was sucking it up. He said, like, I can't get on top of this. It doesn't matter how hard I try. I can't clean up the mess that I'm in. It doesn't matter how much I try. And I was talking with my son. I'd met his son. He was a young adult. 
I told my son, I, I think we need what Brandon has. And he says, what do you even believe? You know what I told him? Come and see. I tried to argue with him. He grew up in a completely different faith mindset. He had no idea what I believed, but he wanted the message of Jesus to be true. So who does God want you to open your eyes to see? The three knots. People not in church. How many of you know someone not in church? If, if you don't know someone not in church, you need to expand your circle. It's not hard in Broward County to meet someone that's not in church. How many of you know someone that's not going well? Like, it might be their marriage, it might be something with their kids, it might be their finances, it might be their house, it might be their work. How many of you know someone that's it's not going well? How, how many about someone that's not prepared for it? Like, they're getting ready to have their first kid, and they're like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> you people are like that all the time. One of my favorite evangelists, his name is John Maxwell. Uh, he's a famous author, Christian, that left being a pastor to go into the business world um, to share the message of Jesus. And he will go to companies like Boeing or, or West Point or GE, and he shares business leadership principles. And oftentimes, they'll ask him at the end of it, where do you get all of this? He's like, oh, you'll be so disappointed if I tell you. No, for real. Like, where did you learn all these things? These are incredible. We've never heard it like this before. He's like, oh, you'll be so disappointed when I tell you. Where did you get this? He's like, I got every one of these things that I teach, I get them from Scripture, from the Bible. And then, sure enough, he's like, oh, okay. But, but he'll go to these companies, and he shares these business leadership principles. He says, hey, we're, we're going to be done for the day, but in 15 minutes, if you come back, I just want 15 minutes of your time, I'd love to just share my faith with you. And he just shares his story. And what he says is, in these companies like Boeing, about 90% of the people come back. And at the end, he said, hey, if any of you want to know God the way that I've come to know God, can I, can I just pray with you? He said about 50% of, the, 50 of the people in the room are like, yes. And as he has interactions with these business people, he says many of them just see God the wrong way. They think that God is mad at them or God is distant or uninvolved. They look at the church and they think it's this judgmental club. The way that they see themselves is that they are bad and they are far from God because of the choices that they've made. And they look at religion and they're like, it's just a bunch of rules that I could never live up to even if I tried. And, and here's what he does. He tells them something really simple. He says, life's complicated. You want to get it right. We're here to help. What's he saying? Come and see, because the answer in my problems is the same as the answer in your problems. It's God. You have a God-sized problem in your life that only God can fix, and you need to learn to know God and walk in God's ways. John, the middle school boy that grew up much later when he actually wrote the scriptures, he began his account of Jesus with this. He said, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, meaning the word being Jesus, like that God became a person and lived among us. We've seen his glory and the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. And in this verse often splits the church where there are two sides in the church. There's the grace side and there's the truth side. And the truth side is you need to tell them, tell them they're going to hell. Tell them they ain't living right. You know what? They're right. But they're not called to be right. You're called to be effective. You're not called to win arguments. And the grace side is, but they just need Jesus. Jesus loves them. He doesn't want to change anything. Jesus, just, just see Jesus. And they're right. It's by grace and grace alone. It's not by works that no one can boast. But the key word in this verse is right here. It's full. The Greek word for full, for full of grace and truth, means to fill to the brim, abounding in, or thoroughly full. What, here's what he's saying. The grace of God is not competing with the truth of God. They exist completely together. In fact, I'd like to teach it to you like this. Grace takes you as you are, but truth won't leave you as you are. You see, because truth without grace is mean. But grace without truth is meaningless. Some of you are like, I don't know that I like that statement. 
Let me phrase it to you in another way, because if Jesus is truth and Jesus is grace, I'm just going to change one word. Jesus takes you as you are, but he won't leave you as you are. You see, Jesus doesn't extend to you grace and truth. He is grace and truth. One of my favorite stories in the scripture that I learned in, um, in uh, Sunday school. Anyone go to Sunday school growing up? Everyone learned the Zacchaeus song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree to see what he could see. Some of you are like, I have no idea what you're singing. You are blessed. You don't need to know what I'm singing. It's fine. Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector, a modern-day mob boss. He used the Roman law to exploit people, and he had the government's backing to do so. He was hated, but he had heard about Jesus. He had heard about the miracles of Jesus. He heard about the redemption and the healing and the freedom that could come by Jesus. Jesus shows up in his town, and he climbs this sycamore tree, and he sees Jesus walking in the distance. And, and the truth side of the church is like, you need to tell him he's short, he exploits people, and he deserves hell. The grace side is, no, just tell him that God wants to forgive him, and he can keep exploiting people. No, it's, it's meaningless. See, Jesus goes up to Zacchaeus, and he says, hey, Zacchaeus, I want you to come down from the tree. And we're going to go to lunch, and we're going to go to lunch at your house. Can you imagine all the religious people, how they're responding? Like, what? You're not coming to my house? You're going to his? Do you know what he does? He says, I know exactly what he does. And, and Scripture doesn't tell us what happens at the lunch. We just find out what happens afterwards. You see, he got in the presence of, of Jesus. He met the grace and truth of Jesus. And what we find of Zacchaeus is, I'm going to give four times what I've stolen. Grace and truth. Grace saves. Truth frees. I know right now we're in the middle of a COVID spike, and I think at the other side of it, we live in a community. I ask people all the time, what's your biggest need right now? And you know what I hear all the time? I just need friends. I miss, I miss gathering with friends. I, I need community. I need something real. I don't know what to believe. I don't, I don't know what this is. I, I don't know. I think we're going to see people returning back to church again. So we've decided to make it easy for you. Next week, I'm starting a series called Love Different. So Love Different is going to be a three-week series. I'm going to teach about a different kind of love. Next week, I'm talking about romance, a different kind of romance. It's going to be very different than the modern romance. It's going to be the God romance. And then I want to talk about friendship. What did God originally design to our relationships to be like? What did he want his church to, to be like? And I'm going to talk about um, family. What was God's design for the family? What if love looked different? And then it ends on Labor Day. And the next week we're going to do a series called Influencer. Oh, there's love different. Here we go. My wife made that, didn't she? Do a great job. The weekend after Labor Day, we're going to do a series on how do you engage and lead in a culture of compromise. Here's what I hope you hear today, though. Church is for you, but it's not about you. See, what I find to be one of the most beautiful parts about church is it exists for the people that aren't here yet. what he wants from you and the greatest at the end of your life the stories that will matter to you the most are the stories that like Carrie's and the stories that like Paula and Eddie's because found people find people the greatest stories of your life are the ones where you pray God give me Holy Spirit would you lead me would you give me three people to share my story with today 
and just tell him, who were you before you met Jesus? How has your life changed since meeting Jesus? When did you meet him? His people are our heart. So I want to do something different today. I've done a lot of things different today. Some of you are going to feel like, wow, you took it to another level of uncomfortable. It's fine. God wants you to have those stories. I just want to ask you, would you be willing to be used by God? Would you just pray those simple prayers? God, would you give me three people today? Somebody at work, someone in your family, some person you just randomly meet, someone you do business with. Would you just share your story? Because let me tell you, none of our stories have it all together. And you don't have to wait until the harvest comes to share the message of Jesus. If Jesus can use the Samaritan woman at the well to reach her city, he can use you. So if that's you today, and you're willing to jump into the mission of God, I want to ask you to stand. But don't do it because anyone else does it because I think it's going to become cool. But are you willing to jump in the mission of God? And if you're willing to jump into the mission of God and say, God, would you use me and my story to bring hope and life into the world around me? I want to ask you to stand. Because I want to pray for you. And, and if you're not there yet, that's fine. It's okay. But Father, right now I pray. God, that just as you sent your son God, I pray that you would send us. I pray that our eyes would be open to see the lost and the hurting and the broken all around us. And God, I pray that as we share our story, God, that you would speak to people. And God, that you would bring salvation, that you would bring grace, and you would bring truth. All in a spirit of love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.